All right, guys. Welcome back to the second installment. So I noticed that um, when I changed the screen here, it went black. But you can still listen to it, so that's good. All right. So let's move on. Uh, anyways, let's not waste time. Let's go over Chapter 7, Founding a Nation. 1783 to 1791. So it seems like a decade since we last talked about history. And since you, I guess you talked about history, I pretty much talk about history every fucking day. Um, what last time we talked about was about basically um, the effects of the American Revolution. Hold up some time up here. The effects of the American Revolution. Uh, so, talked about the Articles Confederation, talked about it being a weak, uh, a document, the first constitution, it heralded uh, a constitutionalism, uh, not just in the Americas, but throughout the rest of the world, eventually, uh, going from a monarchy to a constitutional uh, form of government, it's really important. Uh, perhaps one of the uh, greatest or most important or significant legacies of the American Revolution is that. Uh, but also, uh, we're in debt. Uh, we're poor. We have no money. We owe a lot of money, um, not just to, to French, uh, Lafayette, for example. French car that brought us the ships. I think I mentioned this right before we left off from, but I'll just recap this to re refresh your memory. Um, but we were in debt. We owed a lot of money to uh, our own uh, patriots, compatriots. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, colonists gave a lot of money uh, to raise the Continental Army, to maintain the Continental Army. Which was a ragtag army, right? No, not a professional standing army, as Great Britain had. This is another one of those, uh, his legacies of the American Revolution, right? About this, this ragtag militia men uh, defeating uh, the greatest empire at that time, at least Western European empire, right? The Ottoman Empire. Uh, in the East, uh, Eastern world was definitely huge as well. Uh, the Ming Empire in China was also pretty big, uh, but there were definitely signs of collapse, mostly because of these Western empires who were on the rise, particularly Great Britain throughout the world. Um, so I think this is a perfect segue, actually, into uh, Chapter 7. Um, so at the beginning of Chapter 7, which I think better fucking read this textbook, right? Um, Begins with uh, this notion of empires, right? That right after the the American Revolution or during the American Revolution, people were calling the what became the United States empire, right? Whether it's like a rising empire that's supposed to extend from uh, all the way um, to the South Sea, where you know it was the Pacific yet, whatever it was, the South Sea, um, or whether it was like uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, imagined. Empire of Liberty, right? As opposed to like Great Britain or France or even right a perfect example of Spain being this empire of conquest. Um, the United States, on the contrary, is an empire of liberty. So everywhere we go, everywhere we conquer, we're not conquering, we're spreading, right? We're spreading liberty. Right? So this is liberty based on on principles of the Declaration of Independence. <clears throat> so we're in, a, uh, in this imperial framework still. Right? This is not between like nation states yet as it is now. This is uh, empires that we're still dealing with. And the US is a, it's a baby empire. It's, it's coming into this, uh, into this fight of empires. And so, um, <clears throat> There is this notion, though, of American empire, right, this empire of liberty as being unique, right, exceptional to the rest of the world, all these other empires. Uh, so this American exceptionalism, 
and uh, that's I think it's a good time to uh, test this out. And a little fancy uh, iPad pen and shit. Cool. Um, and I mean, Blackboard. And let me write this word. This is a grand word you should learn. Share blank whiteboard. And let's. Terrible handwriting. American. Well, Y'all know this already. Exception. Um, uh, meaning basically that America, right, is this unique country, right? Yes, it's an empire. Uh, it's, a, it's a new empire. It's a book. Maybe we want to talk about the U.S. as empire. The book here. Hopefully, this is, this is showing. Let's go back to. I'm done with this. Uh, just running backwards. I don't know how to fix this. Anyways, um, the new empire. Walter Lefebvre, for example, talks about we see. Right, people don't see the U.S. right as an empire, the conquering, that colonizes people. But obviously, it's doing that, right? But Thomas Jefferson and these people have this notion, right? This rhetoric that no, we're a different empire. We're unique. We're exceptional. Right? And this is still uh, this rhetoric of the of U.S. being unique and exceptional is still a very strong uh, ideology that runs uh, through the present day and influences a lot of uh, policy making, not just in the U.S. but abroad as well. So this American exceptionalism, right? And some of it is really true. We are, you know, somewhat kind of unique, right? I mean, right off the back, right, and just drop it, popped out of my mind. Um, like racism, right? It's like not uniquely American, but we do like have the most lynchings, right? Something like that, right? But anyways, going back to this time era, 1783 to 1791, uh, America was uh, physically isolated, right? It was a big old fucking ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, between the rest of the European uh, empires, particularly Great Britain and France, which were the bigger ones. <clears throat> um, and I didn't mention about France having its own revolution, right? It's how it backfired, it became really radical. The Jacobins and Robespierre, Maximilian Robespierre, and the Reign of Terror, how we get that that the word terrorism from that basically is that uh, Rob's peer, um, he, uh, I guess I should fuck with this more, huh? I'm, I'm learning this here. Uh, why, why is this not showing? Well, I mean, blue and black and white, that is kind of like a, I need red, actually, for friends. But Rob's peer, um, he is, <clears throat> uh, who took over after the, uh, the French Revolution, and he basically busted out with the guillotine, <clears throat> chopping heads off. Yeah, I remember that, talking about that in class, I think, at least to one of those classes, one on YouTube. Um, so the guillotine, right, Rob's peer, the reign of terror, right, terrorism. So it's political, uh, so you scare your opponents to death, or you just chop their heads off, so they could vote right. Um, so that, uh, the, the notion of revolution became kind of like uh, tainted with blood, basically, with this whole French Revolution. Um, so what I'm trying to get at now, right, this is that Europe at this point, as always, basically, is in turmoil again. Um, let me get, I got some notes here, I'll bust it out, uh, from 1789 to 1815 specifically, uh, Europe is in constant warfare, right, pretty much world wars, basically, uh, these empires fighting against, uh, who is in war? It's Great Britain and France, right, trying to take over the world, uh, after Robespierre, Pierre, uh, he gets his head chopped off, right, uh, gonna fight fire with fire. And who takes over after this to uh, calm down the things? Uh, we don't restore the monarchy as we did in Great Britain. 
uh, in France here, where we're in France now. Uh, we don't restore the monarchy, but what we do is we get this, this guy comes out into power, this military guy. You might know him, he always has this little fucking pen in his, under his shoulder. <clears throat> He's short, like me. Um, Bonaparte, Napoleon Bonaparte comes into power, and he consolidates power uh, militarily, right, to, um, creates a coup, uh, takes over um, the directories of, of the French government, and he kind of, I mean, yeah, he kind of consolidates power and kind of brings a little bit of peace and stuff. Uh, he declares himself emperor, <laughs> uh, Emperor Maximilian Bonaparte. Um, uh, but yeah, so anyways, this is not a French history class, it's not, uh, we're going to go on on that, but basically American exceptionalism is guaranteed, this myth is kind of backed up, right, it's a stereotype, it's kind of backed up, but it's with physical isolation of the French people. Uh, another thing that's, uh, you, that, uh, the U.S. has, that Europe doesn't have, the old world does not have, is this youthful, right, this young population. People are really young, uh, whereas in Europe, our, um, it's too much populous, very populated. Uh, in tandem with that, we have a whole bunch of land. Uh, granted, it's not us, it's not ours, right? there's a lot of Native Americans uh, that still live across the Appalachian Mountains, across the proclamation line, uh, but there's still a lot of uh, distribution of land available. And America, as compared to the old world in Europe. Also, uh, there's a lot of presses that create uh, that uh, newspapers that dis disseminate newspapers and books. Um, to the beginning of colonialism, remember New England, right? Where we had one of the first presses, Harvard University, uh, one of the first presses here. Uh, <clears throat> talking about the 1600s here, right? 100 years ago. So we have a lot of presses. So this is a, a literate constituency, a literate uh, population here. Right? So there's some unique exceptional characteristics right, that, that do justify, support this concept of American exceptionalism. Um, however, right, I'm talking about land now, right? Everything's about land, basically. <clears throat> right? Without private property, private ownership of land, this whole capitalist system we live on kind of collapses. That's why there's a whole big deal about rent and all this stuff right now. Anyways, um, <clears throat> controlling the territory is not easy. Uh, there's no easy task to control the West, right? This, which means just across the Appalachian Mountains. So from the Mississippi River to the east of the Mississippi River, up to the Ohio River, that little area. So just check a map. If you wanna check it. I would. If I could, I would share a screen, but you can't do that on Blackboard. Maybe it's just such too soon. <clears throat> but uh, there's about, uh, by, in 1790, right, by, towards the end of this chapter 7, there's 3.9 million Americans living here, and most of these people are living on the Atlantic coast. And now, there's a people penetrating the squatters going towards the west, right, what we'd call the old west back then, right, which was like uh, the Ohio River Valley and down the Mississippi River. Um, but most of the people lived in the Atlantic coast. Um, all right. <clears throat> so, and the, and the nation was a rural nation, right? Sm small farmers, mostly. Um, industrialization hadn't hit yet. Uh, mostly because Great Britain had a patent on, I forgot what specific machine to make things run in an industrialized society. Uh, but we're not there yet. We'll get there to a, a couple of chapters from now. So anyways, we had the, the Articles of Confederation. It was very weak. It was drafted in 1777. It was then ratified in 1781. So there's two processes to get uh, a big law enacted or an amendment later on. Uh, first you draft it, you write it down, and then you ratify it, which means that all the states or the colonies vote for it, yes or no. Uh, for the Articles of Confederation, it was all 13 colonies, unanimous, has to vote for it, and they did. Um, the only thing they probably voted unanimously is to ratify the Articles of Confederation. 
for the constitution, on the other hand, it was uh, only nine out of the 13 that had to uh, ratify it to make it go into effect. Um, you see that happened. Um, the drafting of the U.S. Constitution, which happened in Philadelphia, Philly, was in 1787, and it was ratified in 1788. Uh, pretty, pretty quickly, James Madison already had a plan. I think I already showed you the video about this, so I'm kind of going to go quickly about this really, really fast. So, Articles of Confederation really weak. Uh, the strong thing about it was, uh, well, the, the reason why it was really weak is because it maintained state rights. The right to tax, the right for economic policies, the right for uh, setting voting restrictions or not, requirements, was all held on to the state's discretion. Um, so this meant that each state had its own currency, each state had its own economic policy with, I don't know, Great Britain, France, right? So there was no uniformity, there was no United States, right? Um, there was, this is the articles of, there was a confederacy, not a unity. Um, so a, a very weak central government and very powerful states. Uh, and this uh, <clears throat> would boiled up again this issue of states' rights in the Civil War. Yeah. Right, the only good thing about the Articles of Confederation was the land ordinances, these land laws uh, that it had, that it made. So anything west of the Appalachians, they had a really good uh, way of setting up control, of setting up the governments. And this was all based on uh, Thomas Jefferson. Um, idea of <clears throat> sub-government, right? But I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. All right, so uh, the, so we have land ordinances. Uh, so we have stages, basically, there you go, of sub-government uh, that would eventually admit these land, big, big tracts of land in the Ohio River Valley and the Mississippi River Valley going down uh, into the Union, right? So, for example, Indiana, Ohio, what other states are around there? Midwest, right? Uh, Michigan. Uh, all those states were, uh, right, eventually it was a process, an eventual process of admission. But the whole end point was that they were going to be admitted, nonetheless. And who lived there before? Native Americans, right? <clears throat> so these land ordinances gave uh, the national government. Uh, jurisdiction of this new land. Uh, it was part of this empire of liberty. Like, yes, the national government had jurisdiction over this land, but it was going to set up small little states uh, that's going to be self-governed, right, states' rights, right? Um, the idea here was that, that the Jefferson had, Thomas Jefferson was the one that drafted these land ordinances, uh, that Thomas Jefferson had was that liberty was only possible in small little territories. Right? Uh, so that's where you kind of maintain states' rights, and states are kind of smaller. If you uh, maintain this big national government to try to control a big territory, <clears throat> only a certain sector of that big territory is going to take over the government. And it's supposed to represent everybody, but it's not. And that was Thomas Jefferson's idea, right? So. No big businesses, no big farmers, no everything small little plots. Right. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. Shit, I don't know. No, I hope not. Just talk a lot. Uh, which is in contrary to what James Madison would have, the Federalists, right? not the Republicans. Here we have two different the emergence of these here, right? Between how we control Government. Uh, so land ordinances, the Northwest Ordinances, Ordinance, Northwest Ordinance of 1787. Uh, it was all about terri it pretty much stipulated it made into law this concept that territorial expansion westward had to go hand in hand with self government. This is what liberty is. This is the embodiment, the expression of the empire of liberty. Okay. Uh, also, good thing about the Northwest Ordinance, haircut somehow, uh, is that it banned slavery. Yeah, 
and banned slavery back in 1787, right? Everything west of the Appalachian, whether it's way south in the, in the, the Natchez, back in the Mississippi, down in the south, or up in the Great Lakes, in the Ohio River Valley. Uh, slavery is banned, officially, right? The jury, right? In law. But in practice, you know, right? You, you guys think that shit was uh, uh, followed? Of course not, right? Uh, but anyways, in paper, slavery was banned in the what we used to call the old Northwest. Now the Northwest of uh, the U.S. is Seattle right, and Oregon, but back then it was Ohio, and all the way down south from Ohio all the way south through the Mississippi River. <clears throat> Get some more time. So under the Argus Confederation, we have a weak government. Each state had its own militia, its own currency, its own right, its own government, basically, its own sovereignty. Uh, and then we have this one, this, this all, all these little events happening that are showcasing that we need some kind of like big strong government to oversee the states. For example, a lot of criminals uh, commit a crime and once they move to another state, different jurisdiction. Right, um, one of these things, one of these events, right, criminals, right. I'm talking about criminals here, about like you know rebels or whatever. It depends on who you are, on how you call it, right. So this is a government officials calling people rebels, but in reality, for example, in Shays Rebellion. So let's move this. Move this. Uh, Shays Rebellion. Right, it's Daniel. Daniel Shay. Dan, Dan the man, Dan O'Shea, right, uh, one of the leaders, not the leader, but one of the leaders of this rebellion of uh, what we call indebted um, farmers, indebted farmers, basically farmers, small farmers, right, this, this the idea that Jefferson had, the small uh, yeoman, uh, that owed money to either the banks or to the courts. This is in Massachusetts. So, Mass. Um, and they own they own money, so they're going to foreclose their land, take over the farms. So, Daniel Shays and a bunch of other farmers led a rebellion, 1786, 1787, uh, and totally took over the courts, burned them down and stuff. Uh, and this probably like made people convinced that a stronger national government was necessary. This energetic national government is absolutely necessary for this. Let me see, let me see if I can change this. I'm gonna go over. No, whatever. So this this is an expression of pure just public liberty. We couldn't have that. We couldn't have public liberty. Uh, we need to put limits on democracy. So overall, the new U.S. Constitution, so we scraped the Articles of Confederation because people were just getting out of hand. There was too much freedom by the mass. So we're gonna put limits on democracy. So overall, the U.S. Constitution uh, curbs these excess of democracies and cuts of democracy by a lot. So the Philadelphia Convention, right, it took four months to draft. Um, already talked about the Virginia, the New Jersey plan, right? That's why we have uh, the House of Representatives and the Senate. So I won't go over that in detail anymore. Uh, but basically about these limits on democracy, because now we have indirect voting. We don't vote for the president directly, right? Just the electoral college, right? So there's this idea of indirect voting, this tedious process really, of having a, of voting for a president, or voting, uh, or back then even voting, uh, you wouldn't even vote for a governor back then. It would be appointed, uh, or these uh, most of them would be appointed. The governor would be elected by delegates, right? So the masses wouldn't be directly voting. Also, uh, you have property qualifications. You didn't have property, you couldn't vote. So the the founding fathers here, right? Thomas Jefferson, uh, who the fuck else? Uh, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, uh, Alexander Hamilton, all these founding fathers, right? 
what they wanted to do was to curtail the excesses of democracy, the excesses of the masses having power. Because they didn't want to have Shays rebellions again. Right? They didn't want to maintain power. What they said maintain power to people that were worthy, that had land, and that knew what they were doing, basically. Right? These 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 farmers, these everyday farmers, right, these workers don't know what they're doing. And we are the educated, the elite. So we know we know how to control people. Right? This is very akin to uh, to Plato's the Republic. And this is way back in like the BC era, so this is about 2,500 years ago. So Plato is a Greek, <clears throat> uh, ancient Greek philosopher, and he has a really good book called The Republic. And he has this notion that philosophers should be the kings, right? And because philosophers are the smarter ones, right? they, they know they, they have reason. Right, and this is a kind of like the same kind of notion that these founding fathers have. That these people, first of all, they have land, so they know how to manage land. So that shows that they would know how to manage a territory, right, such like their state or the U.S. People that don't have land, how do they? How do you know that they know how to manage in an office, right? Being in charge of a big territory, like being a governor, right? So this is like the, the mentality these people have, right? So we're gonna cut, right, the power that the masses could have. Only the rich and educated and the people that have land, right? If they have slaves, even better, because now you know how to manage not just land, but even also people, right? Kind of shows that you're worthy of being a governor, of being a president. I mean, for the first pretty much 80, what, 75 years, uh, all the presidents were slave owners. You know, all the founding fathers were slave owners. Right, the people that wrote this constitution. Let's talk about slavery in the constitution. It's a really good topic. Right, so slavery, right? All these people are slave owners. All of them, right? Except for except for Alexander Hamilton, actually. Um, well, he had indentured servants. Right? He's from he's from New York. He's from, he's from this city. He doesn't need slaves like people from South Carolina or from Virginia, like Thomas Jefferson does. Right? Thomas Jefferson has over 200 slaves. He even fathered a couple of children with one of his slaves called uh, her name was Hemmings. Right? A black slave, and I mean, he raped her. Right? And now, right? There's there's descendants of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemmings who are black. Right? Um, anyways, right. All these people are slave owners, but the word slavery does not come out in the U.S. Constitution, at least the original Constitution. Uh, the word slavery does come out later on with the amendments, the Reconstruction Amendments, the, I think it's the 13th Amendment, uh, but that's in 1865, after the Civil War. Right? But the first OG U.S. Constitution does not have the word slavery. There are three types of people in the U.S. Constitution, the original one, or basically throughout the whole thing. There are Indians, not taxed. Uh, there are other people, which means slaves, and there are people. We, the people, right? So, there's people, right? Who is we, the people? Is white, landed people, white, people, white men, pe white men with land, white landed men. Uh, then there's Indians, not taxed. Right, they, they don't get taxed, so they're not part of this uh, policy. They're not citizens, they're not nationals of the U.S. They're members of their own sovereign tribe. And then the last category of, I guess, people is other people. And that's just a euphemism for slaves. But the word slaves or slavery, so slave system, whatever, does not come out in the U.S. Constitution. Although all of them are slave owners. Right? 
So and the reason why this this come out, there was a debate, right? People did want to put uh, right Hamilton, right again, Benjamin Franklin, right, even though he had slaves, right, was a little bit more enlightened. Uh, and wanted to put some uh, some curtailment into the slave system. Uh, that didn't happen, right? People from South Carolina and Virginia were very very adamant against that, for obvious reasons, right? Uh, <clears throat> so this goes against to uh, the notion of kind of a constitution is this based upon? Is this based upon the notion of uh, how do you get? How do you become a citizen? How do you become a member of this polity called the United States now? Um, let's change the fucking color. <clears throat> is it based on like your civic? Is it a civic nationalism? Or is it ethnic nationalism? You might say, what the fuck is the difference, right? So civic nationalism is basically you just do your civic duties. You uh, you respect the laws and you respect the institutions, right? You follow the law. You stay at your home. Don't go outside. I'm being fucking serious right now. Don't go outside unless you really, really have to. Right? That's the law right now. Right? You're being civic. Right? You go to vote. Right? You do your civic duties, right? Um, get the drift. Uh, that's civic. Ethnic, on the other hand, right, is based upon uh, your language, right, a shared language, a shared culture, uh, what else, a shared heritage, right, it's ethnic, ethnically based, right. At first glance, if you read the U.S. Constitution, and it's there in your textbook in the appendix, the back. Appendix A, A3 or A10 or whatever. Uh, it's in the back. Uh, it's really short. It's only 2,000, or the first without the amendments is 2,000, 4,000 words. Um, it's it seems like it's a civic nationalism that we're uh, pushing for. Uh, but no, it's not. It's a blending of both ethnic and civic. And some more, some might argue that it's more ethnic nationalist, right? The United States polity, the way we uh, govern ourselves and govern others, more based on ethnicity than on civic duties, right? So an argument could be made like, you know, uh, right now what's happening, right? Um, most people are going to get a check, right? 1,000, 200, and plus whatever, 500, if you have a kid or not. Uh, but if you're undocumented, you ain't getting shit. Taxes, most of them do their civic duties. Right. There are some bonds that are criminals, right? No, no less, just like any other group of people. But most of them, for the most part, do their civic duties, right? So under the civic nationalism, they would be given, right, nationality, citizenship. But we don't. So there's a big argument saying that we're no, we're actually based on this ethnic nationalism. So you have to fit a certain category of ethnicity, namely, what is it, right? White, right? being white makes you a citizen. And this is pretty blatant in this time period. <clears throat> Even more so than that, right? Um, so the ratification process of the, the U.S. Uh, Constitution takes four months. Um, it, takes, uh, it takes longer than the Articles of Confederation. The Articles of Confederation was really quick. Right after the American Independent, right after the American Revolution, sorry, Everybody signed the Articles of Confederation. We're one big state empire. Sorry, we're one big empire, Great Britain. Fuck you. We just greet you. Ha uh ha. -huh. But the, the U.S. Constitution took a longer time to debate. Four months. Some, some long time. It's pretty much how much we're gonna be inside, right? In quarantine, right? It's gonna be four, four months. <clears throat> um, the reason why is because. The biggest reason, well, there was a lot of reasons why slavery was a big debate. Another big debate was uh, they didn't have a Bill of Rights. This fucking uh, constitution didn't have a Bill of Rights. Um, almost all the states, all the colonies had a Bill of Rights in their own constitution prior to this. And this one didn't 
doesn't have any. This is a big uh, opportunity to uh, display uh, a split that really gives birth later on to political parties. So keep in mind here that at this time and period, there are no political parties. There are no Republicans or Democrats or whatever, or Whigs or whatever. There are no Republican parties. Basically, the way you vote for a president or a vice president is who has the highest vote is president. Whoever has the second highest vote is vice president. Doesn't matter if you're political rivals or not. That's the way it is, right? Uh, but the birth of political parties, right? The roots of political parties are between this, this split here, between what the historians call, or what they call themselves actually, the Federalist versus people, with them, some historians call them anti Federalist. But well, that's too, that gives them like already like a negative connotation. It's kind of unfair. It doesn't really capture who they are. Even the Federalists call them Federalists. It doesn't really capture who they are. It's more complex than that. But instead of calling them anti-Federalists, the other camp, they're what they call themselves were Democrat Republicans. And this is not political parties yet. This is just ideologies. Different ways of looking. Where is that? Oh. Okay. That's the wrong button. So Federalist versus a Democrat. Rip. You know what? The fight this is recorded. You can go back. <clears throat> uh, ideology. The political way of thinking. How are we going to run this big empire, liberty, or this empire called the United States? Right? So the Federalists were all about, you know, uh, people were like, Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, uh, James Madison, uh, John Jay, right? They actually wrote a book called The Federalist Papers, right? So uh, their ideas were about, uh, um, they were actually against this whole debate about including a Bill of Rights. They were like, you know what, this, we, have, we have federalism. That's what they call federalists, right? And we have federalism. Basically, the idea of federalism is how you, the relationship between the state and the national government. So for uh, Hamilton and John Jay and for uh, James Madison, we have checks and balances. And we have this balance of powers. And uh, we have three, there's the judicial branch, there's a legislative branch and the executive branch. And the whole point is that not each one is going to take over in power and overpower the other one. Each one is going to check and balance each other's power out. Right? So it's redundant. Right? It's, 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 it's kind of useless to add a Bill of Rights to the Federalists. Right? Talking. And the Democrat Republicans, the anti Federalists, Right, where people like Thomas Jefferson, uh, Samuel Adams, um, and basically like the old veterans of the American Revolution, they're like, no, 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 man, like we just fought, for, like we're not the veterans of the American Revolution, and they're like, no, we just fought the monarchy, right? We just fought a strong government, a strong national government, and you you want to give us back to that, right? So we need a bill of rights to guarantee individual liberties. So what I'm alluding here now is the fight between public liberty versus private liberty. There's a big, you know, the public liberty is like, uh, the most extreme example of this would be like 
Daniel Shea in Shea's Rebellion. Right? It's, it's the public that has just the absolute liberty of self-government. And private liberty is like, no, 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 no. Right? We need to control, first of all, private, private property and secure that. Liberty is about securing private property, not about public uh, politics, but about private accumulation of wealth. That's the basis of government. So the big difference between the Federalists and the Democrat Republicans is that the Federalists are basically uh, the supporters, right? That tells you a lot, right? There's a big an old saying saying that, uh, so my, my mom used to say this, like, tell me who you hang out with and I'll tell you who you are. Right? So the people that the Federalists would hang out with had you know, the supporters, where people like uh, the urban elite, the aristocrats in cities like New York and Boston, right, in big cities, right, particularly north. Cities where there's a lot of finance and capital, right, and market, right, and a lot of uh, trade and commerce. Uh, big commerce, right, uh, and also the rural farmers that were connected to these uh, big cities that were dependent on the, this, this market that was going out from these ports in New York City or in Boston, for example. So these are the Federalists. The Anti-Federalists, or the Democrat Republicans, as they call themselves, <clears throat> were small farmers, right? These uh, the small farmers, these small manufacturers, in the rural areas of the U.S., right? This is agrarian Republican, right? This is one of the reasons that they got the name Republican, right? It's not concentrated power, it's the Republic, right? This, uh, this idea I imagined by Thomas Jefferson, right? So it's about basically the fight here is about the big city urban aristocrats and elite versus the small farmers. And oh, this is right here. Um, this is kind of straight up picks up where chapter uh, eight starts off and I'll uh, send that on Friday I'll record that tomorrow on Friday right. well, thank you for listening I'm sure this is fucking as fuck for some maybe you go through it but make sure you're uh, keeping up with the uh, with changes and please stay, stay home stay safe and uh, yeah Peace out, guys.